Good morning. Well, as you can tell, my English is horrible, so I'll be talking in Japanese today. Thank you for attending this unique or maybe weird, um, sort of different session instead of the others that are happening right now, which, by the way, include Assassin's Creed 4 Black Flag, Road to Next Gen Graphics. This sounds really cool, um, and I would even go there. <laughs> Regardless, the fact that you chose to sit in this weird and sort of niche sounding session instead of the other wonderful talks means that you guys are also weird, just like in the title you see here. So um, some of you may already know this, but um, just kind of a FYI, um, you're free to take photos of the slides throughout this presentation. Um, but uh, I usually don't show my face in the press or the media, so I'd appreciate it if you can refrain from taking photos of me. However, I do know that doesn't really um, fly over here. So for those who would still like a photo, I do have something ready at the end of the presentation. So um, maybe you guys can hold off until that moment. So let's jump right in. Today's conclusion. <laughs> Yay, conclusion. Well, with anything, speed is important, I guess. And, you know, we want answers right away. Um, there really isn't a thing we gain or benefit by holding off on coming to any conclusions, right? So if the session is going to be boring, you're thinking I should just ditch this one and go to Assassin's Creed 4. So <laughs> I understand and I feel the same way. So I'm just going to go to it. Yeah, I said it. Uh, gameplay and story, not the most important things. As written here, personally, story and gameplay elements don't really matter to me. In the same way, how to make money and techniques to create beautiful graphics aren't important themes to me either. I have one goal when it comes to making games, and somewhere in between, I will touch on story and setting and how the uh, and the hows and the whats. But there are no more; they, those two are no more than means or steps, and all I care about is heading for the goal. However, it is extremely important to explain what exactly that goal is. If I had to interpret it into words, I suppose it could be um, view or vision, but that's not entirely it either. So then, what's my purpose and what led me here? What do I think about when making games? I'd like to talk about these things today. And while you're probably confused or have no idea what I'm saying, rest assured, I'm not really saying much. So while I'm at it, I will talk a bit about how the scripts were developed in games I worked on in the past, although I have a feeling many of you came to listen to that more than anything today. So self-introduction here, you know, but the stuff isn't really that important to me either, so I'm going to omit the details, but I've been game directing for some titles released by Square Enix. You guys are probably familiar. And oftentimes the games I make are described as dark. Um, or maybe even a bit insane. Um, I'm not really aware of it, but if others say so, I guess they are. As with any game creator, there are a lot of, um, there's always first. Originally, I was a 3D CG designer, um, and really by chance, I ended up directing and script writing. When, I was, when it was time to write a script for the first time, I thought, well, I can't write one without knowing the ABCs of writing. I've never done this. So I bought a few reference books, you know, like on Amazon, the ones with a lot of stars and great reviews, something like The Hollywood Method, How to Write a Story for Blockbuster Movies. And so I read those books and I have no idea what they're talking about. So not knowing what they're talking about, uh, for example, like these, um, what is the self-concept of the main character? How does the main character view him or herself in the world? How does the main character wish to be viewed in this world? Like, what is self-concept, and how does that relate to an interesting story? I just didn't get it, and maybe because it's because I'm stupid. But you know what? For a while, I was nodding my head trying to read through it, but probably mm, not even 10 pages in, I gave up. But this is work. I have to write the script. So I didn't really have a choice, and so I came, in, came up with my own techniques, and they are backwards script writing and photo thinking. 
I came up with these techniques on my own um, and thought that maybe all writers uh, were using the same kind of techniques, but they were just keeping quiet about it. And that's why I also didn't go out of my way to explain it. But recently, I asked around professional scriptwriters and novelists. A lot of responses were, no, I don't work that way, or that's a different method. I don't know. I don't really believe them. I think they're still hiding it. I have a feeling they use the same techniques. Anyway, you might be thinking, so then how does one who even can't understand a reference guide come up with this story? And let me explain. And oh, by the way, the photo thinking word is on, you know, I made this up. So you guys are the pros in English, so feel free to replace it with something that sounds more natural. Okay, so let's move on. So backward script writing. Simply put, it's the, re it's the process of creating cause or reason starting with the conclusion of the story. That's how it's done. So I'm going to take Nier as an example. This is the story flow. But it's the condensed version made specifically for this occasion. As you can see, there's a beginning at the top and an ending at the bottom. A story is a series of small events. They branch out or quests can run in parallel, but aren't most games and their stories pretty much made this way. When making a game, this is the very first thing I put my head to. The reason is very simple. It's cost. We often don't have the luxury of time and money to create the story and cinematics forever and ever. And we have to work within our limitations. And if you've never made one before, um, I suggest you refer to games that are similar to what you're making. And not to sound so bold, but I'm saying you should maybe mimic what they're doing. For example, if you want to make a game like God of War, count the number of stages and events and roughly estimate the volume, and then create a similar structure, then you'll probably come up with something similar. You should be able to do the same with something like Devil May Cry. But God of War is a project with a massive budget. Simply copying and what they've done is definitely not the smartest idea, and you'll get burned. So I'd say aim for about 70% in terms of both quality and volume. I feel this is uh, the basic design process um, for any small to mid-sized developer. Um, so let me just add something here. So what is this emotional peak, you ask? It's a strong emotional feeling created within the player by the story. Sadness, fear, love, pain, smart or, or cool. Emotions like these when our hearts are moved. In the story, these peaks represent those feelings we want to communicate to the player. In Near, the title I worked on before, contains a few stories. For one of those, the idea was that the woman was going to die. To explain my point, I'm going to write out the emotional peak as such. So I just replaced the emotional peak with a girl dies. Let's just say it happens around midway through the entire game. So I place the story here, but just by staring at it in text, uh, there's no sadness. It's just plain. It's almost like a joke. However, the emotional peak will come. And why? It's because there's some kind of reason. So there's always a reason that supports or forms the emotions. For example, I'm going to write down here a very sad event that may be familiar with a lot of you. So your pet died. Your dog who cared for you since you were young, a child. Your dog who played with you and grew old together. Such a nice and kind dog. That dog sadly lost its life and is now in heaven. A simple but very sad event. So let me uh, put together another similar event. A game character pet died. At first glance, I don't think people will feel sad. What's the difference here? It's because the pet hasn't, sh uh, hasn't been sharing your life with you. In other words, the differences between these two are the differences in past experiences. Then what we can do is to add the experience to the second line, the game character pet. I mentioned a moment ago, the, ga the dog that always played with you or the dog and his devotion to you, you guys growing older together, a kind dog. These reasons to trigger or bring out the sadness is what we need to present to the player. 
And in doing so, the player should feel a similar type of sadness as if your real dog died. It should create an emotional stir within the player. So a moment ago, we were talking about the girl dies. So I asked myself, what kind of reasons will make people feel sad towards the situation? First, the feeling of sadness is oftentimes triggered when the weak are treated in a cruel manner. Then who are these people who are weak? Knights and cavaliers, countrymen aren't. The weak are powerless people in society and with no military power, as an example, young female children. Thus, for the emotional peak of girl dies, the reason I imagined or gave it is that the female is a young girl. And that's not the only reason. If the sadness is great, the subject must be very weak. Maybe, or for example, um, a disabled person and I'm not trying to discriminate against, you know, females or the disabled, but this is just more of a character setting. For Nier, at least, this is how it was done. So she cannot speak. To add to that, the young girl has a very kind and beautiful personality. She's really done nothing wrong, but unfortunately, her life was taken away. And that's why it's very, very sad. Furthermore, there is great sadness the moment she dies. Her happiness she was supposed to experience was shattered. Imagining what that is or could be, it was her dream wedding, something that she always wanted. So I'm going to take a quick step back and look at what I have here. All the information is really bunched up in one area. But that can't be happening because for me, the death of this young girl is very tragic. She's not someone I just met yesterday or today. As with her family, I must have known her, from, known her well from before. So these events are spread out over time as with the fact that I've known her well from before, I layer on the reasons from the beginning of the game. And in order to extend the period of my relationship with her, the girl's death has moved to the latter half of the story. So this completes the flow. And then I just add on various events throughout the story. And some, the emotional peak is an event that happens as a result of layering on the various experiences. So like a stack of coins you see here, this is a, let's just call this an experience stack. Starting at the bottom, there are sad events. And those are the reasons. At the very top is the girl's death. I go look for the reason that leads me to the true sadness here. Not the things that are considered sad written inside a book, but the real sadness and its reason. Think about that and neatly layer them on top of each other. Then you'll reach the emotional peak of the girl's death at the end. Emotions are triggered from the differences and experiences. Thus, you must neatly stack up the various reasons. The more you experience, the larger the emotional peak at the end. Therefore, in the game, the act of gaining experiences should be maximized in terms of both scale and time spent. And of course, if you feel the same way about uh, developing emotions and feelings for the player, that's, what, that's where the focus should be. So this is what I call backwards script writing. But the new arrow coming from the top to the bottom is how you play the game. The conclusion, girl's death, went looking for the reasons for sadness. The player enters the, enters the game from the beginning, the point where the story starts. If the reasons are stacked nicely and effectively, the player will reach the emotional peak, 
waiting at the end. I feel that this is the same in real life. For example, you became friends with someone who is very strict and just played by the rules. Then why is your friend so strict? Maybe the school or their parents and friends are also strict. Or maybe your friend, well, then maybe your friend lost someone who lost their life ignoring a rule and had a very regretful experience. And that's why that person is very strict towards you. And oftentimes, we find, it, we find out the reason much later, though. And we are moved by finding out the reason. Uh, what I think it is, is you should follow the process of how you are moved emotionally. And of course, there are numerous emotional peaks in a final product or a game. And each of them demands a stack of reasons to make sense. And as you see here, these stories are concurrently happening. They're concurrently happening, but in a game, as I said earlier, there are many stories being told at the same time. It's not just one story. And so obviously you need uh, to prepare a lot of reasons to get to that emotional peak. What happened? Why did it happen? How did it happen? And the volume is quite large when you start thinking about that and listing out the details. And this is where most people get confused. There's just way too much information to digest. That's where the other technique comes into play. That's photo thinking. As the word says, photo thinking is envisioning the situation in your head. For example, the scene of the girl dies. So let's just see the situation, how it's, how it's written out. So she was killed during her wedding. She was stabbed to death in the stomach. She's a citizen of a different land and culture. And she wears a mask. I think about these situations or settings. But when it's only in writing, we're lacking information, like what's going on in the background? What is the feeling like? What's the reaction? When this happens, I always try to visualize it in my head. So here's a screenshot from Nier. You don't have to visualize it to this degree or to this level of detail or the shots that led up to the moment. What's key here is that we need to include all the supporting factors of the sadness we are feeling and wish to communicate to the player. The girl is dying. The prince is by her side. In her last breath, she mutters to him, thank you for marrying me. We visualize that scene in our head and a lot of thoughts start circulating. A fragile young girl, muttering while the prince holds her dying body, her bloody hand. That is the scene you see. That's photo thinking. So there's a method called the memory place, uh, the memory palace of Matteo Ricci. This is used to enhance your memory. It's a technique where you build a memory palace in your brain and you place items you wish to remember inside the palace as you visualize it in your head. I kind of wanted to try this with you today, but it takes a little time, so I'm going to omit that. Photo thinking is an application of visual memory skills. It's not about remembering something specific, but it's going there to see the scene. In other words, it's going there to create or generate the scene. So you're probably thinking, no, 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 I don't see anything, or I, I don't think I can see anything. But that's not really the case. I think everyone can see something. Uh, the reason for this is, so it's uh, more unnatural for humans to visualize an empty space with someone standing there. If you look around, there's sky, the ground, and clouds, and the wind blowing. You should be able to see that. 
So this is a young girl's hometown. Sandy air, yellow skies are what you see and what stands out. The atmosphere here at the village is very somber, caused by the sad event of the girl's death. That's the situation here. By seeing this scene in, the man in this manner, the image is embedded into your brain as the setting in the game. So here I am back at the flow chart. There are several emotional peaks and reasons. We just visited the young girl's hometown a moment ago. Since her death, we knew that mood in the village is dark and depressing. So when a different episode or branch of the story is related to the girl's hometown, we will once again see the gloomy skies and a very saddened village. So I know I can't be wrong because I've already seen and been here before. This is the biggest merit of photo thinking. By traveling inside the brain in this manner, that world will gradually start to form itself. To see or to visualize is key. For example, I was here six years ago at GDC. I remember a roomy, spacious hall. Folks sitting on the ground eating their sandwiches. And, and you know how those lunch bags, is, lunch bags out here have an apple in it. It's for me, for a Japanese, that's just too much for us. We don't eat a whole apple like that. Stuff like that, totally random scenes. It doesn't really matter. But because of that, I just still remember it. To visualize is an important technique when telling a story because you're able to do so without changing the structure of the story. That's how I see it. But there's one thing you need to be careful with photo thinking, and that's to not over visualize things. For example, this is where the young girl is dying. She is killed moments after the wedding. Imagine you visualize the ceremony as grand and glorious wedding celebrated by thousands of guests. However, in order to make that happen in games, it takes a lot of effort and the number of guests have really nothing to do with the young girl's death. Seeing meaningless or useless things along gets in the way of creating that emotional peak. Young script writers will ask me, I'm thinking too much about the setting that I really can't get into it. And I think what they're doing is they're seeing too much of the meaningless and useless settings. If the emotional if the most important emotional peak of sadness is what you want to communicate, you should not visualize anything other than that reason. Emotional peak and the reason, that's really all you need. One of the important points of photo thinking is to make every effort to not visualize anything outside of those two things. So with photo thinking, so then what's important to me? Okay, so let's go back to the beginning. I've said enough about the story, but at the top, I also said that story and gameplay are not the most important things. What's my goal then? And what do the two techniques, backward script writing and photo thinking, have to do with it? So let me explain. So here's me and the players on the right. So we are game creators, so we make these games and share it with the person on the other side. Players will play the game and hopefully feel something, an emotion. I design games and write stories, but my goal is to cause an emotional stir inside the player's brain. So the fundamental goal isn't inside the game sitting in the middle. It's the event that occurs inside the player's brain. This is the goal we must consider most important. And speaking of playing games, there's something that I've been thinking about recently. So here's a photo of GameStop and inside the store. I see a bunch of games on the shelf, but I don't get as excited as I used to. I don't know, I gave it some thought. Why am I not excited? The number of well-made games has increased, but at the same time, the number of games that make my heart beat and Give the feeling of, I have no idea what to expect, that excitement, that's gone down. We've gotten used to seeing amazing 3D visuals, and we have plenty of stories that move us. 
We have entertaining action games as well as a ton of social games you can casually play at any time. Big budget box uh, games provide long time play hours with beautiful visuals and with indie games we see a ton of cute stylish bite sized games. They're all great. I'm sure you can imagine this in your head as well and if you can that means uh, that means it's not surprising to you. As with film and novels, slices of culture that have matured, perhaps we're also entering a blind alley. But I want to fight that. I want to strongly believe that there's still a huge potential for games. Take a look at this. It's a very simple image here. This shows the potential games. So on the outside, you have things you just can't do. So this refers to things such as expressions that are not allowed um, ethically or simply unattainable due to costs. For example, there's a limit as to how far we can go with sexual expressions, and I will never have a chance to work on a game that costs $100 million. And then the inside here covers things that are possible with games. So then, are we doing everything we possibly can? Here's a screenshot from Nier. If you played it, um, I think you get it. You know what the meaning behind this is. Uh, it's just a simple subscreen. It's a shot in the. It's a screenshot from the subscreen where the items are being deleted automatically. You see the empty tabs on the left hand side. In Nier, the player will lose their save data in exchange for the main character saving the girl. This is an important data that the player has been saving throughout the game. In the story, the ending demands the player's save data. When I was thinking of the end for Nier, I thought, how can I make the players move or feel an emotion in this particular area, in this subscreen area where the save data is? So I synced up the emotional peak with a data, uh, the save data being erased here in the subscreen. I was actually photo thinking a player watching that happen right in front of his eyes and he, his reaction was, are you serious? serious? What's happening in front of me? And from there, I started script writing backwards. Instead of entering or manipulating the story itself in game, my goal was to interfere with the player's real life experience or their gain and loss by breaking in and to move the player. So I'm going back here. This is uh, this system of the story erasing the player's save data isn't crossing any ethical lines and is doable within cost. However, it's not something that is commonly done when making games. Someone said, I think Nier took one step into the zone where games should not go. Maybe so. Maybe that's, that falls into this gray zone here, the unknown. In other words, in between things you can and can't do, there exists a gray and fuzzy zone where you're unsure if you can do it, the unknown territory. It's been quite some time since our industry started. Within the cost and time allowed, we are making games intelligently and at the same time, certain sort of rules and standards have been set in place. Games must be played for a certain amount of hours, or gameplay needs to be fun, or story needs to move people, rules like these. And we call this the invisible wall. The invisible wall only covers the potential games and doesn't allow for anything else. But is this really too? true? Isn't there more we can do? For example, let's say there's a full price box game that lasts 10 minutes. <laughs> No one would never approve this, but what if, what if those 10 minutes were the most beautiful 10 minutes you, you can experience here on Earth? Or another example, a game no human can clear. Can that not exist? Or another one, an item you can only get by chowing down 10 Burger King Whoppers in 10 minutes. <laughs> or one more, a social game you have to clear to graduate school. Just thinking about these things, these ideas, make my heart beat. I sense that there must be a lot of emotional peaks that are possible on the other side of that invisible wall. 
So here's a real example. This is a machine called the Small World Machine, manufactured by Coca-Cola. Many of you may know about it or have seen it or heard about it, but here's this quick story. This vending machine with a monitor display was placed in two countries, one in India and another in Pakistan. Unfortunately, as we all know, these two countries have been divided by decades of warfare and conflict. The machines are connected through the monitor display, which is kind of like a telephone TV. The folks in both countries can see the audience on the other side. On the monitor, a simple game pops up, and people from both sides must play together at the same time. If they're successful, the machine will roll out a can of Coke. That's really it. It's simple. As a game, though, uh, the lag between the two is horrible. And the game itself, upon closer look, obviously isn't really anything substantial. I mean, it looks pretty boring to me. But, you know, if you really think about it, it's pretty awesome. An area where console games didn't go, or we didn't think of going, that other side of the wall. This is a great example of bringing down the wall and marching right through it. You know, obviously this is a showcase or demonstration, not a permanent display, but feel like we game creators can figure out a way to implement something like this into games in a permanent way or a constant fashion. So entertaining story, fun game system. These already exist in this world. The thing I'm most interested in is, is this gray zone. I want to see what's beyond that wall. Whatever or however you want to call it, it's the space where no one has entered yet. It doesn't have to be all positive things or emotions or experiences. It's the kind of experience that will make an adult want to pick up a game at the game store. It's the kind of emotion you get when an adult is so frustrated and throws his controller. An experience you can't really review or evaluate on Metacritic. This is because these exact reasons is, because, uh, is why I fell in love with games in the first place. So then, what do we do now? So for Nier, um, I was deeply influenced by the events of 9-11 and the world thereafter with increased terrorism. An unfortunate event triggered out of a situation where both sides believe that they were doing basically the right thing. Well, so then what do they see from their point of view? What does it look like from each other's, perspe per each other's perspectives? These thoughts went through my mind as we worked on Near, But it's not about changing the world with this, with a game. That's just not Im impossible. That's just impossible. Plus, I don't have the ability or the power to do that. So I'm 43 right now, as I mentioned at the top. I wouldn't call it young. I've been in games for about 20 years. But I don't really have a solid sense of seeing a new world on the other side of the invisible wall. Not to mention, I wasn't even able to change our game industry. So I look at it this way. I spent 20 years and I failed, but I still believe in the potential of games. And that's the reason why I'm here today. So I wasn't able to overcome that invisible wall in these last 20 years. However, let's say if 10 of you here in the audience today challenge yourselves over the next 20 years, that's 200 years worth. Or if there's 100 of you, that's 2,000 years worth. Although I was unable to break the wall, I believe it is possible if we all try. Especially most of you here, who I assume are much younger than myself, you were all born with computers and networking environments around you. It was so natural to you. And the skills you possess are probably different than mine. The potential of video games is huge, almost limitless, endless. I would like for you all, from me, the next generation of developers, to break the wall and step into the other side. 
I want you to create something that will wow us, that will dazzle us, the world, and make me feel that excitement I felt when I was young. That's what I look forward to, your creations. Best of luck to you all. Thank you. Thank you for listening. So we're going to, um, oh, sorry about that. So thank you for listening. I hope you gained something from my talk today. And just knowing that makes me happy. And we're going to move on to Q&A. However, you know, at these types of settings, when I do talks or sessions, um, I often get asked the same type of questions. So I know we're all limited on time. I'm just going to quickly go through some FAQs. And they're pretty short, so please bear with me. <laughs> First, tell us about your new game, Guard 3. I get asked this all the time. So I served as a creative director on this project. Um, I took a small step back, if you will, from being hands-on uh, onto the game. The work was beyond my imagination, though, and I pretty much died. <laughs> I did die, actually, once. In terms of the game itself, the US version has yet to be released, so I just can't say much about it here, and I apologize. Next. What do you think about social and smartphone games? Also, a question that I get asked a lot. You know, with anything, with a new trend, I always get excited. There are a ton of clones where the exterior skin or graphics of the game is different, but the inside is pretty much the same. I don't think it's a bad thing. In fact, it's sort of amusing in a way that it's a culture we don't really have on the console side uh, or the traditional side of the business. Um, but, however, that pattern is already getting old, so I'm hoping we'll see something different and unique with social games. Next. Why do you make, why do you only make these dark and insane games? So I get this a lot, but I'm just not really aware of it. Maybe a little crazy, but there is a reason why um, you meet a bunch of crazy characters, <laughs> maybe in my game. I just can't imagine for someone to go back to their normal life and self uh, as if nothing happened after killing hundreds of people. Like, to me, I think stories with a happy ending where the guy runs back to his girlfriend and he kisses her and hugs her after a bloodbath battle is just kind of dark and crazy. I think that's weird. So next. So why don't you share your face in the media? And so I've been doing this um, from the early days, and some of you already obviously know that. But no matter what type, a large media outlet or students interviewing me, I don't. And I treat them equally uh, all because I think that's important. So, you know, today here talking in front of you, this is me, the usual me, the everyday me. Uh, maybe some of you may want to tweet or take a photo of my non-mass non face. Um, as I, much as I want to politely ask that you don't, I know it's impossible in this setting, especially if there's press uh, media in the audience. So, so I did bring this here all the way from Japan, my mask. So I'm going to be wearing this for the next couple of minutes. And I'm going to throw up some slides from earlier. So if you do want to um, take some photos, now's your time. And then in between this time, we will open it up to um, QA from the audience members. So um, if you have any questions, please walk, walk up to the mic. But I'm going to just keep my mask on. And so I won't really know who's asking. Uh, me the questions, but uh, please, if you have any questions, um, come up to the mic. Yes, Hello. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, besides the many games you'd find on the shelves at GameStop, I'm curious to know what you think about the uh, independent developers and if you feel like they're exploring this gray area that you're describing in your lecture. Eh, the indie game, the first time, 
のものは僕すごいすごいなと思うものがいっぱいありました例えばあの最近ようやくクリアしたんですけどリンボー LIMBO リンボー伝わりますかねそれをプレイしましたここまで通訳してください So,、um, I'm going to split my answer in a couple of、uh, phrases. But,、uh, so, in the early days,、uh, for me at least,、um, of all the indie movement,、uh, I thought there were really great titles. They were、um, eye popping, and I was really impressed.、Um, so, Limbo, I just recently cleared. The first one is the first one. 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 The first one is その世界に対して貧乏に対してではなくてそういうことを許容している世界に対して僕は本当に怒りましたインディーゲームの冒頭にはあったかなと思いますただあここまで訳してください And、uh, so while I was playing、uh, first of all you know you're playing a, a, not an adult but a child character a, a small character and just the deep deep meaning of the title、uh, was something that really grabbed me And at the end of the game, what I, was, what I felt most was that I was so frustrated,、uh, full of anger, and I was so upset, not at the character, obviously, but just the world that they were able to create in Limbo. This is a game, a very small 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 game, a 大体似たようなことになってきてるインディーゲームはおしゃれでちっちゃくて可愛いけど深い何かがテーマがあったりすごいギャグで持っていて楽しいとかそういう一回見たことがある一回これ体験したなと思うようなものが増えてるインディーゲームにも僕はやはり見えない壁が徐々にできつつあるとそういうふうに感じています So,、um, you know, their compact size are small but really expressive and you know, they're challenging something、um, And I, I did feel that the early sort of days, I guess if you can say that,、um, that was just so impressive、um, to be able to do it in such a small kind of manner.、Um, but to be completely honest, I feel like because that kind of set the tone of what could maybe be defined as you know, one definition of、uh, an indie game, I feel that、uh, the recent releases、uh, sort of follow a very similar path.、Um, they're stylish, they're cute, but they have one theme, and you go really deep into it.、Um, so in that sense, I don't feel like I've seen anything that is another layer of kind of new、um, and a, a new discovery. And I just feel like With even the indie scene, that we're going to start to see the gray zone. So, this is just a slide. I know I didn't use this in my presentation, but kind of just for fun. <laughs> okay, so I think we have time for one more question. So, I was. Hi. Uh, no. Hi. Oh, sorry.、Um, so, I was kind of curious about your thoughts of、um, approaching,、uh, sort of finding this new. Um, idea,、uh, innovation in, in narrative that creates that emotional peak you're talking about、um, at, through sort of more player authored experiences rather than top down coming from the designers.、Um, for example, one thing that, that's really fascinated me、uh, is looking at board games and how they sort of use multiplayer dynamics to kind of create a,、um, a A sort of a narrative experience within the context of the game. For example, one is like、uh, the game Twilight Imperium, for instance,、um, has a lot of mechanics that revolve around trust and around sort of complex kind of interactions between players that I feel sort of、um, emergently creates sort of these、um, conflicts between the, between the players themselves instead of you know, experiencing it.、Um, uh, the,、um, You know, from a distance of other characters. So I was just curious what your thoughts of either you know, looking at board games for inspiration or just、uh, player authored、um, solutions in general. Wow, that was a long question. But a good one. いわゆる最近日本でも言われているナラティブとかそういうプレイヤーの体験そのプレイヤーが自発的に行動する内面から生じるいろんなことっていう。ことだと思うんですけれど基本的には僕が思っているのは
プレイヤーが物語を与えられて感じる心とプレイヤーが自発的に何かを感じる心というのは同じですそれがなぜ同じかというと悲しいと思う理由は皆さんが絶対的な悲しいシステムがあってそれによって悲しいと思わされているのではなくて皆さんが今まで得てきた経験皆さんが今まで得てきた知識そういうものによって悲しいという感情が形作られているんですねある種僕が悲しいという理由を提案したのは先ほどの例はその一般的な例だと思いますそれと同じつまり心が動くということに関してこちらから与えるのもそちらで自動的に感じるのも違いはないと僕は考えていますお願いします So,、um, I'll go with the conclusion first, since that's how we started this presentation.、Um, I believe、uh, whether or not, or, or if we take the player authored sort of experience or the,、uh, the top down sort of, you know, you being already provided the narrative,、um, I think the end result is, is the same.、Uh, what I mean by that is that. Let's talk about the reason、uh, that causes sadness, as we did in, our, in my deck earlier. So, sadness is something that is not sort of controlled or defined by an absolute sadness system. It is、uh, each and every one of you have learned、uh, what it is that sadness is in, in your life or in your experience or in a story or in a game through experiences. Through, Through experiences that have formed throughout your entire life. So,、um, this is a very general example, but、um, the fact that I can provide you a story and that you're moved and that you feel that sadness and that you're playing a board game and something happens and that sadness is sort of automatically, naturally, but automatically triggered inside your body, the end result is the same for me.、Um, so, it doesn't. Really matter how、uh, or the methodology、um, that we're talking about that triggers that sadness.、Um, at the end of the day, it, it is triggered inside you, inside your brain, in your body. What is the name of today? Okay, thank you so much. Please return your headset when you exit the door. Thank you. Thank you so much. This was very much、uh, very enjoyable and fun for me.